great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Tom Montregali to uh, our pulpit and to speak at, uh, uh, again at our missions conference this weekend. Uh, Tom is a Fleming, is that right? That's what you're, you call someone from, from Flanders, the, the north region, if I'm not mistaken, of, of Belgium. I read Wikipedia last night, so I know this. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's wonderful to have Tom here. Uh, Tom has labored as a missionary uh, for most of his life, uh, is now embarking uh, on the 1826 uh, project to raise up uh, future generations uh, to go and to serve. So he's uh, well qualified to uh, give us uh, this uh, sermon that we look uh, so forward to hearing this morning. Tom, uh, that we would see Jesus this morning. Thank you for being here. In Flemish, they say, Good morning. Good morning. Oh, good morning. So. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to uh, be with you uh, again this morning. Um, uh, thank you for your faithful support, uh, not only to me, but to all the missionaries that you. So that you know, support and pray for. So, so why go and keep going? Uh, fuel for the journey. That's what we talked about yesterday. We will continue to talk about that today. And we will first turn to the scriptures and then get into the second part of this message. And uh, we turn to the Great Commission passage in Luke in Matthew 28. Sorry. And we read verses 16 through 20. Now, <laughs> to the eleven disciples uh, went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you to the very end of the age. And then we turn the pages to another gospel, the Gospel of Luke. We turn the pages forward to chapter 5, where we read verses 1 through 11. <laughs> on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Nazareth, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out. Of them and were washing their hands. And getting into one of the boats, which, uh, which was Simon's, he asked him to put, out, to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep, and let down your nets or catch. And Simon answered, answer, Master, we have toiled all night, took nothing, but as your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they, looked, they enclosed a large number of fish in their, in their nets for breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both, filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knee, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all, for he and all who were there with him were astonished at the catch of fish he had taken. And also for James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid, from now on you will be catching men. 
when they have brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So yesterday we looked at why go and keep going, fuel for the journey under two headings, from Master Jesus to Lord Jesus, and from Master Jesus to Lord Jesus, who is merciful, forgiving, and loving. And today we're going to look at two more go and keep going principles. But first I want to begin by summarizing, you know, the message we heard yesterday by asking the same question. Why go and keep going? Well, as I said yesterday, it's impossible to make disciples of all nations without going. In that sense, going is imperative to the enterprise of the Great Commission. But there is more, as Jesus accentuates the main reason to go and keep going, with the use of this little word, therefore, literally, having gone, but therefore, having gone, therefore, disciple the nations. Why? Because Jesus is the victorious one, reminding them of his victory by saying, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And behold, I'm with you to the very end of the age. Therefore, go and keep going. But more, the victory proclamation of Jesus and its imperative to disciple reminds his beloved disciples of the bigger picture. The journey that started three years ago and all they had seen and been taught. Why go and keep going has a three year journey behind it, reminding them of the fuel for this ongoing mission. Which brings us to the text here in Luke chapter 5, in where we are introduced to the beginning of this journey, when Jesus said, from now on you will be catching man, or as Mark puts it, chapter 1 verse 17, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And so here is the question that I want to ask myself and I want to ask you. What enables us to go and keep going? What? Why should we get excited about it? Why should we be passionate about it? What, what drives it? Well, this is why we are looking at these four go and keep going principles that I think are foundational for this calling. And the first principle was introduced under the heading from Master Jesus to Lord Jesus, where we meet Peter's, whose vocation represented an area and an opportunity for Jesus to expose one of Peter's greatest needs, which is to see himself and his Master Jesus as they truly are. Because what Peter perceived to be an area of strength, being a fisherman, kept him truly from seeing himself and Jesus as they truly are. And therefore comes this second request of Jesus to put out into the deep and go fishing again after the finished teaching. And of course we read uh, his response, Master, because you say so, even though we've caught nothing, because you say so, I'm going to obey. And the question I asked you yesterday is, why did Peter obey? Why did he respond in this way? Does Peter truly believe that he and his partners, as they are pulling the, the boat back into the water, are going to catch fish? And we came to the conclusion after looking at the scriptures that he does not, but that there was great doubt in his heart. But you see, Jesus is more than just your average Jewish rabbi or teacher, master. And for Peter to come to grips, with his calling to become a fisher of men, his perception of Jesus and himself needed to change. And so exactly when the fisherman finds himself full of confidence and strength, Jesus enables himself through this great miracle, which is a miracle of mercy, 
to, for Peter to see himself as he truly is and to see Jesus as he truly is. And so when Simon Peter realizes what has happened, who may have happened, and for whom it happened, he is completely and utterly beside himself. He is completely undone. And he only has two, two things he can do. He can either run away or he could fall down before Jesus and cry out, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And so what a difference in Peter's first response. The Master Jesus, the Lord Jesus. Peter's perception of himself and Jesus is now where it needs to be. Peter says, and we have to say with him, I am a sinner and I repent of my unbelief and my pride. And that kind of genuine confession and repentance can only happen before and because of Jesus the Lord and of Jesus the Master. And this brings us then to our first goal and keep going principle, fuel for the journey, which is basically to see ourselves as we are. We need a Savior, don't we? We need saving yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Christians are saved sinners called to go and keep going to unsaved sinners. And it's going to be very difficult to do that without recognizing you have a constant need of a Savior. Because if you don't, why would you want to bother anybody else with it? It's one of the key motivations to go. You really cannot share God's grace as someone sick if you don't rest in it. And you cannot rest in it unless you, you see yourself as you truly are. And go to Jesus and His grace. The second principle was introduced under the heading of the Master Jesus, the Lord Jesus, who is merciful, forgiving, and loving. Where we discover that the Master relationship does not only keep you from seeing yourself as you truly are, but also keeps you, keeps you from discovering one of the two key aspects of Jesus' Lordship, which is the Lordship of love. Because look how Jesus responds to Simon. He simply said, do not be afraid, which is the gospel cry of the Old Testament. Do not be afraid, as we read, it, as we read this morning, because God is merciful and kind and loving. And so when Peter hears this, this is what he hears, Jesus said, really, and it's what we need to hear, Jesus is saying with this short response, Peter, look, I, have, I love you. I've come to bless you with my mercy and my love. I, I want to show you how to trust in my love. And with this response, Peter really discovers the essence of his lordship, which is a lordship of love. And this brings us to the, another go and keep going principle, foundational fuel, which is the need to come to grips with the Lordship of Jesus, which is the Lordship of love for you and me. Learning to accept and trust in Jesus' love for you is one of the keys to become a fisher of man. So essential to keep going is learning to rest in God's love. Resting in God's love for you is, it is hard and almost, I would say, impossible to share God's love if you don't have need of it yourself constantly. And if you don't rest in it yourself, how do you want anybody else to rest in it? But now we come to a third key, the go and keep going principle. From Master Jesus to Lord Jesus, who is merciful, loving, and forgiving, and is supremely powerful and ruler of all. Now, the third fundamental principle then in making fishers, in making fishermen of men, is to learn how to trust in God's power and rule of all things, which is another key aspect and definition of the Lordship of Jesus. Peter and his partners are now ready to hear the words of Jesus and take them to heart. Don't be afraid, he said. From now on, you will catch men. 
But here is the key. The key is not going to be the fisherman expertise. As much as I would like to think so. <laughs> it was not primarily going to be their gifts or their talents or their knowledge, and that's important, or even their desire. That was going to be the key fundamental ingredient for catching them alive. No, the first and foremost key ingredient is going to be the need for faith in the power and the rule of Jesus over all things. This is where it all starts. Everything always begins and ends with God. And so the purpose of the miracle was not only to have Simon understand, understood how much he was loved, but another purpose of the miracle is for Simon to understand that Jesus is omniscient and that he is all powerful. Just as Jesus had known the whereabouts of the fish, so he knows the whereabouts of those he has chosen. And I know this is a hard concept for us because we cannot fully comprehend God's choice of why he does it. But he knows. He knows his people. Past, present, and future. You don't choose anybody. You are a vehicle. God does the choosing. He knows. He has the power to regenerate unbelievers, heart of stone, a dead person. And Jesus had directed this these fish to a particular place where they could be caught, as I said yesterday, well, so he knows where those people are. And often he will bring those people to you. He will be in charge of bringing these people to you. I remember when I became a believer in Frostburg State University in the mountains of West Virginia, as a junior in college there, he brought me to this young freshman was a member of the varsity. And I was ready. God had prepared in all those years. And four weeks later, because of this simple gospel presentation, I bowed the knee to Christ. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest, Matthew 9. And we are his workers who labor in, who labor. In other words, those who go and keep going. In faith, trusting God will do the saving. We don't have to save anybody. We pray to the Lord of the harvest, and we go out in faith, trusting that God will use us, and that His power will work through us. It's where it all starts. Now, for us, the ultimate challenge is always control. The challenge to go and keep going is always a challenge of who's in control. And we wrestle with that. Jesus kept reminding the disciples, oh, you are little faith. Why don't you trust in my power? Why don't you trust in my goodness? When we read Hebrews chapter 11, we are reminded of the men in the Old Testament, the patriarchs, who were called to live by faith. In this power of God and this love that God had for them. And when you read of Abraham, you know that faith is his relationship to God. He asked him to go to a place that was not his home. He asked him to go. They not only went because they trusted in his power to provide, but also because he cared for them, he loved them. And those two things are very important because power without love is a very dangerous combination. Why do you think husbands are providing for wives? Because you need to help them. And it is so important to this mission that Jesus actually repeats the miracle. After he is resurrected, he repeats the same miracle in order to get this very powerful point across. 
If you turn to John chapter 21, verse 1 through 17, you can read all about it. Jesus is resurrected. They are again at the Sea of Galilee. And what does Peter do? Well, he does what he does best. What he does best, he comes out fishing, verse 3. And all of a sudden, there's this man at the beach, the, on the beach. And he tells him to throw your nets on the other side of the boat, and you will find some fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to them. And then it comes to verses 15 through 17. And Peter has taken off his clothes and he's dove from the boat into the water to meet Jesus, his friend, his Savior, his Lord. And what does Jesus ask him? He asked him a simple question three times Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Can you imagine? Do you love me more than to be a wife, your children, your best friends? Do you love me more than these? And feed my sheep. He's telling Peter, you know, do, do you trust in my love? Do you trust in my power? And Jesus did not say, listen, Peter and all the disciples, you've been with me for three years. You graduated from my theological school. You know, you graduated from Westminster or whatever seminary you may have gone to. He didn't say that, you know. He didn't say, go, go plant my church. He said, do you love me? And so, with this repeat of this miracle, Jesus reminds them of what the past three years have been all about. He reminds them of his passion, his compassion, his miracles, his suffering. With this miracle, Jesus reminds them of his resurrection and the power of this resurrection. He provides them with all the motivation they would ever need to go and keep going. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me power. And behold, I'm with you to the very end of the age, always love. This is why Paul adds to faith in Galatians 5, verse 6. This says so the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Expressing, expressing your love for God and others. And so over the next three years, Jesus would again show them his power, his love, and teach them all about faith that must find expression in love for him, in love for your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and in love for those outside of the church. So this is a dirty boat, and he got the principle foundation field for the journey. It is a need for faith in the sovereign power expressed in love for him and others. It's one of the keys to become truly efficient for men. And what is needed more for courageous living? that to understand and to know that he is in charge and that he enables us to love others. What else would compel people to leave home? Family, friends, all comforts and security. A familiar surroundings. What else would motivate people to share a message that often would be rejected? Being rejected by family and friends, college students, high school students, co workers, and so on. Now, I introduced to you Murat and I did yesterday in our short videos, the Turkish Chess and the World of Indonesia. And Moran became a Christian in the, Mus the Muslim countries, close to the Black Sea. And when he became a Christian through uh, a Bible correspondence course, he was the only Christian there. No Bible, no church. And then his wife, and he did, began to have visions and dreams of the Lamb of God. And Moran had an interpreted dream.
and brought them to Christ. They're not there. Sorry. From fisher to fish, the fisher of men. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll go catch men. And so they pulled up their boats and left everything to follow him. Now Jesus noticed that Jesus did not say, You will be sure. He said, you will, you will go. Notice Jesus did not say, unless you have certain gifts, or certain personality, or a particular calling that you should all, that you should go, you should all be involved in the work of catching them alive. We all go because we all belong to Jesus, and Jesus belongs to us. Christ resides in us, empowering us, and calling us to go and keep going. And I think Paul makes this point as strong as you, as you can make it when he says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Therefore I go and I keep going. And so the question now is, how, how do we go? How do we share? And I want to come at this a little bit from a, a perspective of being in God. And I ask this question because many of us think primarily of sharing faith in terms of proclamation, which is very important. But often, and often equate evangelism with weeping. And certainly, proclamation has its properties and place with weeping as its ultimate end. But often, it is limited, especially in the sense when, when we are proclaiming to a people who are not ready and have not been prepared to hear the message. To that proclamation seems quite insignificant and sometimes even irrelevant. And so planting, watering, and, and cultivation would have to occur before you could hope to read. And here's the thing God wants for ordinary lives to bless others, and by ordinary, I do not mean mediocre. The stories of our ordinary lives are so much more powerful that we're going to admit. Because your story, your personal story, is related to God's story in you. And so to put it simply, you can share your faith with others in many, many different places and circumstances. You can tell your story at work, in your neighborhood, at school, in the gym, in your homes. It's a powerful story. Christ lives in you. Now, I'm telling you this because people in Belgium and Western Europe and all the places in the world will not respond to proclamation. They are not ready for it, but they are ready for affirmation. They want to see Christ lived out. They are ready for your personal stories. They are ready for your life. And so affirming the message of Jesus is a process of living and modeling the Christian message. You see, Belgium is basically an empty field where much planting, watering, and cultivation needs to take place before we can see anything. Making disciples is a process, and you need to be aware and sensitive to the spiritual climate in which you share God's message of grace. Affirming is just as important as proclaiming. They go hand in hand. As a matter of fact, you cannot successfully proclaim the message of grace unless it has been successfully affirmed. Jesus taught this principle very clearly when he said this in John 4, verse 36 to 38. <clears throat> Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows, the other reaps, is true. I send you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Paul said, like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I planted the polished water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. 
God has designed us just to be who you are for a purpose, for his purposes. So does our faith meaningfully, meaningfully and missionally interact with the people around you? And so this brings us to the fourth go and keep going principle of fuel for the journey. And it is simply this, it is God's desire to accomplish his redemptive work in and through you. Because he is calling you and equipping you to become fishers of men. He is the victorious one. And uh, he leaves us with these, in, in these words, the, the, the parting words. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And behold, I'm going to be very in the age. Therefore, go and keep going. This is what I call to fulfill this discipleship. So, four principles to see yourself in the world of Jesus as you truly are. Christians are safe sinners called to go and keep going to unsafe sinners. Principle two, the need to keep, the, the need to come to grips with the Lordship of Jesus, which is the Lordship of love for you and me. Learning to accept and trust in God's love so you can challenge other people to do the same. Thirdly, is the need for faith in His sovereign power expressed in love for God and others. And lastly, it is to trust that God is working in you to accomplish His redemptive purposes. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Father, thank you that once again we are able to sit and hear the eternal words of our God. Lord, we pray that um, those words will become living bread and living water to us. Forgive us, Lord, when we neglect it, when we sometimes even just run away from it. Help us, Lord, to treasure the word in our hearts and, and may it continue to shape us and mold us. And may it drive us to the cross, and may it drive us to his grace, his love, his power. And may you accomplish your redemptive purposes in and through us. Give us courage, Father. And Father, I rejoice in, in, in the many gifts and talents that you give to your people. Father, may those gifts and talents be used to, to glorify you, to build up the church, and to bring good into the church. Father, bless this congregation, the church of church here in the Lord In Jesus' name, amen. I think we will close our service.